I'm a feminist, but is it wrong that as excited as I am about today's episode, I'm even a tiny bit more excited about the fact that tomorrow night we're having a gala screening of the movie, what I wrote, at Leicester Square Odeon Lux as a celebration with Amnesty International. Ah, I'm too excited. Tickets are from £10.75 and I will be there. I hope you will be there too. Just between us, there's going to be lots of celebrities there. We've got a little red carpet where you can have your picture taken. The dress code is glam, but that's whatever that means to you, even if it's your favourite feminist t-shirt. There's going to be a Q&A with some of the actors and creatives after the film that's going to be quite short. And then there's going to be a very, very exciting announcement from the Guilty Feminist and Amnesty International about our relationship going forward. And we really hope you're there. Go on to guiltyfeminist.com or go to the Odeon website. You don't have to sign up. You can just click through as a guest. If you want 10, 15 or 20 pound seat, you click on classic. Red carpet at 7.30, film at 8 o'clock, Tuesday, 23rd of April. And after today's episode, there is a little bonus episode. I was on Twitter the other day and I saw that a student called Erin Attridge has just been accepted for a PhD or a DPhil from Oxford University, which is my alma mater. Her doctorate was going to be in research into the experience of working class students within highly selective universities such as Oxbridge. And then it turned out that this PhD, which is so excited she got accepted for, which will create policy and practice to best support students from marginalised backgrounds, isn't going to be funded. And I thought, oh no, the irony. So she was saying, does anyone have any jobs instead? So I went to Oxford because I had a screening of my movie, Say My Name. Thank you so much to everyone who's come out for all the screenings around the country of Say My Name. Thank you so much. And so I asked Erin if I could meet her. So we met up in the foyer of the Oxford Odeon before the screening so I could interview her. So you will hear some background noise. That's a cafe. But please, please, please listen, because I think you're really going to want to get on board. Okay, now time for the podcast. I'm a feminist, but yesterday, a very good-looking straight man was telling me that he never makes a move on a woman. Like, even if he thinks someone's cute, he's like, I wait for her to make a move on me. And if she doesn't, even if I fancy her, I'm just like, nah, I'm not bothered. And I was like, that is so arrogant. And he went, well, that's what women do. They just wait for guys to hit on them. And if they don't, they're just like, I don't care. And I said, yes, but that is God and nature's way. (laughs) Now, let me unpack what I meant there. There's so many things in that. (laughs) Yes, yes, there is. But... One, you met Tom Hiddleston yesterday? (laughs) What? (laughs) Tom Hiddleston does not wait for women to hit on him. I don't believe. I don't believe. Allegedly, allegedly... The Hiddleston is a mover. Yeah. Um, Now, we don't know that, though. I don't personally know Tom Hiddleston, (laughs) but I have heard tell, but it is all alleged information. Now, why I said this was because I felt he had me in a check move and I needed a quick checkmate. And so I paused my feminism. Yeah. Briefly. Listen, it happens to the best of us. I then... He left you no choice. He, I mean... Many ways, his fault. God, men are the worst. (laughs) Also, I said it wryly, because if I said, you know, that's the correct way of it, but when you say God and nature's way, it's so wry, it's clearly irony. Yeah. If he didn't take it that way, that's not my fault. Literally everyone, (laughs) everyone knows any reference to God is ironic, right? Everyone knows that. I mean, not always, but if it's coming from me, probably. Yeah, fair, fair. Okay, you do one. I'm a feminist, but I do think having my period should get me a seat on the tube. Mm. I kind of agree with you. I stand by that statement. I kind of agree with you. It's straight up. I feel if all the women who are pregnant and all the people who are aged and all the people who have a disability are seated, Mm -hmm. then menstruation has to come next. Yeah. Anybody who is not disabled... Not elderly, not pregnant, or with child, or carrying a baby. Oh, I don't know. If you're like a fit elderly man. Or one of those glowy pregnant ladies. (laughs) Oh! 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 Wow. I don't know. You know? I mean... I don't know. I I need to think about it. 
no, I see that. I see that. You could argue your ovaries have done the thing that they wanted to do. Sure. Mine are complaining because I, yet again, I have failed them. <laughs> um, I'm a feminist, but I saw a documentary recently that featured a young Susan Sontag in the 60s. Do you know Susan Sontag, feminist from the 60s and writer? And I just sat there watching it thinking, I want her beauty, I want her youth, and I want her boots. <laughs> And if I had been her then, in the 60s, I would have been a go-go dancer on Carnaby Street, <laughs> shagging hot Don Drapers and not worried about feminism till I was older. <laughs> because there's time for feminism. Yeah, and you it's know, not when your boobs stand up by themselves. I just... <laughs> no, no, it is. Obviously, I should not be thinking that. That's why this is an exfoliation oh, or yeah. confession, as it were. But... <laughs> I did think, like... What kind of boots are we talking? I mean, they were like a brown suede to the knee. Nice. And just... Heel? Uh, yeah, I, I don't... I just think of fringes. I like, mean, what kind of feminist was she? Sorry. I mean... <laughs> no. Like, in retrospect, you could have your Carnaby Street cake and your women's lib eating it too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Refrain from making a lesbian sex joke. I knew what you were thinking, They've and I thought, she's going to be too classy to go there. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> Good, good. I'm a feminist, but I sometimes wonder if I could have brought myself to burn a perfectly good bra. <laughs> I had, I'm just saying, it's hard to get one that fits. Mm. Well, I think I would have burnt one that didn't. Burn nice, your, yeah. Burn okay, your yeah. uncomfy t-shirt bra to be showing that you're burning a bra. Oh, nice. See, whereas I think I would have felt compelled to burn the one that wasn't. The push-up. Yeah. That's or what just, we should have burnt. We should have burnt the push-ups. Yeah, mm. you're right. It's, you just burn the t-shirt bra and act like, it's your favorite. But it's, mm. yeah, you're right. I think we you're were right. meant to have burnt all bra. Actually, there wasn't that much bra burning. I think there was one, it's, they burnt a lot of things they called instruments of torture. They burnt stilettos and okay. s their version of Spanx. Oh. Um, I mean, I'm fine with that. That's fine. Yeah, I That's think okay. Spanx are unfeminist. I'm sorry. I, I think they're do. uncomfortable. I have for years, and in shops, when they, and I'm like, I don't know if this is flattering, and they'll be like, just wear Spanx underneath. And I say all the time to shop assistants, I think they're unfeminist. And then they're like, oh. And, and then we have a discussion about feminism and about why. I'm like, if people don't like the body they see, then like, I want to like the body that I see, and I want to wear a dress that I think... Can I just say, when I was on nine euro an hour and listening to every woman come into the shops I worked in being like, do I look fat in this? If I'd been like, well, the real question is feminism, they'd have all been like, excuse me? So <laughs> I can see how from their perspective... No, I don't blame them, but I just want to have the discussion about it. Sure. But then recently I found a dress that was so unbelievably hot and I thought, I'm definitely not wearing Spanx with it, but I'm going to fix the lining. Nice. But then I fixed the lining... And I had to go to an awards thing on a red carpet. Okay. And I secretly bought some black Spanx off Amazon. You're a secret I... spanker. What? <laughs> on a number of levels. Yeah. Uh, but I bought... <laughs> the other levels, not I've the only secret. Worn you them, seem like I've you're... only worn them once and I've lost them. I feel like feminism lost them. You lost them? <laughs> I lost them. Oh, maybe I... your husband hid them. You should ask him. I would hide them. If my girlfriend got Spanx, I'd be like, no, thank you. Would you? They take too long to get off. Like ladies, am I right? No, okay. <laughs> I can see Deborah being like, this is not what you were booked to say. <laughs> okay, sorry. To? Yes, that's fair. No. Um, I am a feminist, but I do think that the men on RuPaul's Drag Race make hotter women than 95% of the women... I have ever personally met. <laughs> Just objectively speaking. I, so I can't come between a woman and her feelings about RuPaul's Drag Race. Right? That's not right. I'm a feminist, but if I could body swap with a white straight cis man just for one day, I would definitely dismantle the patriarchy from the inside in the afternoon. <laughs> but in the morning, oh my God, I would love to spend some time presenting my opinions as facts. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> yes! Yes! Oh. 
Live from King's Place in London, the Spontaneity Shop presents The Guilty Brothers with me, Deborah Francis White. Guest co hosts Catherine Bohart, and very special guest Sadie Hassler and Anna Viglia White talking about indecision. Have you had a guilty week or a feminist week, Catherine Bohart? Mm, I've mainly had a guilty week. Have you? What have you been doing? Yeah. Well, I watched the entire season of Queer Eye, not sorry about it. Yes, Queen. I'm going to I'm going to make a play for that being a feminist. Okay, but because it's so warm and inclusive and open and lovely and adorable. I haven't finished the story yet though. Right, sure. <laughs> Sorry. I started the second season because I've obviously watched the first because yeah. I'm not insane. No. And which is a phrase we may or may not say. May or may not be using that. We're going to be discussing that later this evening. It depends who can own and reclaim it. You have OCD, so luckily. So I can say it. Yes, but you said you weren't insane, so that's tricky. Oh, I don't know. I don't know where we stand. Okay, well, I've watched season one because I'm not straight. And um, does that work Good, better? You are, Thank yes. you. Well done. Well done. And. Um, and so then I watched, started to watch season two, and this is when they got a little bit guilty and a little less feminist, is that the first episode came on, and I realized they were doing, like, a woman. Oh, yes. And I did turn the telly <gasps> off and a huff. What are you saying to me? I went back and watched it, but I when I first don't watched it... even can't watch. I, so... <laughs> I huh? went back and... Okay, first of all, I watched the original season, right? And it was uh, always... We, we've covered that. Okay, I'm just saying... No, all, no, you've no, watched, no, I mean, like... watched all the men no, being not made just, over. No, not just season one, but I mean, I watched the, like, early 2000s version. Oh, so, like, right. Oh, the I'm retro. an ardent, old-school fan. Yeah, And yeah, then yeah. they brought on this show, and I was trying to show my friend Ed, Queer Eye, uh, he hadn't watched it before. But and you I was were calling like, it Queer Eye for the straight guy, and then suddenly it's a woman, and you're like, this no, is amazing. No, I wasn't calling show. it for the straight guy, so it wasn't like I was being like, oh, I'm a pedant, I can't possibly abide this. It was that I was showing my friend, and I was like, you're going to love this, I need to inculcate you to Queer Eye. Mm. He was a little bit dubious, but they bring on the first one, and it's like, it's a lady, and I was like, what? It cannot be a lady. You, can, you won't love it if it's a lady. I'm sorry. And um, I know what you mean, though, because if you're trying to woo uh, someone to woo queer someone eye. to something, you want them to see a classic standard, right? You don't want them to show a deviation. Now, little did I know that that episode, if anyone features a gay it, son. First of all, they totally did a workaround. Exactly, they were like, "This is about a lady, but also about her son." And I was like, "Well played, queer eye." But also, it is actually a very good episode. And to be fair, they made it work, even though a woman was in it. So fair dues. <laughs> Um, fair do. Fair, fair um, play. But fair I did, play. I turned the TV off and a half and I put a different episode on before mm. we watched that one. No, that is a good I'm a feminist but though. That's a really Thanks. good I'm a feminist but. I'm just thinking about that. Because I know exactly what you mean. It's not what you're there for, it's not what you're in for. If you're watching Say Yes to the Dress, you're there for a lady. Yeah. But Queer I mean, Eye, never you've made a show. contract. Social contract. That we will spend 45 minutes watching a straight man being told what to do. By Jonathan Van Ness! Yes. yes. And how to do it, and he will be corrected at every turn. Yeah. And that is why we love it. Yeah. And suddenly it's a woman, and we're like, I'm not on for a straight woman yeah, being told. Yeah, she's fine. No, what? You know, that's not what <laughs> so we've been... True. Or a straight gay woman, or any woman. I love like, that you made that feminist. God, you're a wizard. That was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Great no. turnaround. Oh, fuck, I can justify anything. I loved feminist. that. <laughs> I believe that's my, you. <laughs> that's my superpower. That's wow. why all of these ladies love the podcast. Well done. They yeah, turn it on good. and think, I'm not a feminist. Oh, no, it turns out I am. Oh, maybe I am. Um, <laughs> good job, guys. Mm, well done. It was a team effort. Yes. <clears throat> like everything in feminism. <laughs> they are going to say like everything in lesbian sex. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the same thing. Go on. <clears throat> but is it, not, is it not true? more true to say that I don't want to... I feel like you're... I, I feel like... <laughs> yes, Deborah, you can ask me anything you okay. want. Okay. You're bisexual, right? Yeah. And I want to say that because otherwise bisexual people may write in and say, by visibility, hashtag by erasure. All right, okay. I'm a bisexual who frequently has lesbian sex. Thank you. Okay, no applause for that? Fine. All right. <laughs> I thought there'd be a little bit more. Are you frequently having sex, are you? Okay. I thought there'd be a little bit more for that little piece no, of fine. delightful fine. collaborative inclusion that we came up with then, there. <laughs> that's Don't right. patronise me. Yes. But then it's weird because I guess I would never call sex with a man straight sex. I'm having straight sex. I just call it disappointing and be done with it. <laughs> oh, jokes, but mainly accurate. Yes. <laughs> accurate jokes. It's funny because it's true. true. I feel like, though, as much as this is not what the show is about, but I feel no, like... <laughs> it is, though. It's about... The theme is indecision. Yes. 
And I feel like we are veering into something because I've said many times on the show I feel like I'm bisexual except I just haven't had much opportunity. Yeah, that's fine. To do... It's not like a time-served thing. The... <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like... No, because in that case I've barely been arrested. But <laughs> I've been let off with a caution a number of times. <laughs> oh, Dampra. <laughs> but... That's um... such like... I love that it's such 1940s lesbian talk. Yeah. <laughs> I've been cautioned many a time. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, but I feel like I would miss on a long-term basis, not on a short-term basis. Sure. No, sure. But on a long-term basis, I would miss the penis. Sure. So, a couple things. <laughs> One, we're presuming monogamy. Two, we're presuming cisgendered woman. Just going to say those things from the outset because obviously some women have penises. That's true. But also, most women can buy penises. <laughs> if you got money and you got taste, okay, hold you can on, get a hold really on, good hold one. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Back the fuck up. Is this B-U-Y penises or B-I penises are the new thing I don't know about bisexuality? <laughs> I'm talking about dildos. Oh, okay, yeah. fine. And Just strap checking. ons yeah, yeah. Just Which, by checking. the way, I was very skeptical about as a bi woman because mm. I was like, I mean, uh, really? Is that going to be the same? It can be better. Good to know. Or worse, depending on the person, which is also true of penises. Okay. But also the inverse works, right? Insofar as you might occasionally have like a nostalgic moment for the pain, you can, f <laughs> do you know what I mean? A bit of nostalgia pain. But then it works the other way around where you can have a little bit of like, oh, well, that there were some boobs here. Which is weird because I usually go for flat chested women. I don't know. There's a lot to break down here. I understand that you are very. <laughs> It's a room, I can see the dudes in the room being like, I did not anticipate <laughs> this it's, evening. It's, it sounded like you were quoting Shakespeare. Thank you. When you said, would that there were some boobs here. <laughs> a bit like when a youth disguises himself as a lady or a yes. lady disguise, disguises himself as a youth in Shakespeare as this yeah. happens all the time. Yeah, I'm a basic One of, Porsche a cro bitch. A cross-dressing episode of Shakespeare binging. <laughs> would that um, there were. Would that there were some boobs here. Maybe a new Guilty Feminist t-shirt. Um, yes. I would wear the t-shirt. These guys seem less convinced. Fine. Okay. <laughs> this is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. <laughs> Please welcome to the stage the incredible Deborah Francis White. <laughs> So I'm going to tell you about one of the most indecisive times in my life. I was living in this country and I was in a precarious visa situation. I did not want to go back to Australia where I was born and raised due to the fact that my family at that time were Jehovah's Witnesses and I felt also very... Um, uh, I didn't want to live there. Um, there were just so many reasons for not wanting to go back and I was just like, I can't go back not knowing I have a visa to get back in. So I did what young Antipodean women did then before gay men selfishly campaigned for the right to marry each other. Um, they didn't really think about us at all when they did that. There was an element of thoughtlessness and unkindness in that equal marriage campaign. Because what we did then was pay a gay man to marry us because on the basis that he couldn't get married anyway. I mean, we hadn't forethought the rights that would be won. It just at that time, gay men couldn't get married. I'm talking about last century. What I'm saying is in the late 20th century, when some of you were, I don't know, how old were you in 1997? 12. 12? Well, you have to leave because you're underage as far as this story goes. Um, I was about to go to university, but, it, well, I could only go to university if I had the legal right to stay in this country. So I did what young women did then. 1997, there wasn't... Well, the internet existed, but it was really just some porn sites and directions to a shop. Um, it wasn't like the going concern that the internet is now. It didn't consume our ever waking hours. It was something you could look at at the library. Uh, but websites were very crude. We hadn't yet learnt how to build fire emojis. It was just... It was a different landscape, gang. So what we did then, uh, if we wanted to find a gay man to marry us, 
uh, we put an advertisement in the Gay Times. Um, we went down and you'd sort of send off a cheque in the post. Then the Gay Times would print an ad. And the wording was something like, gay man wanted for mutually beneficial... Arra- like, mutually beneficial was the term that I was told to use by a New Zealand girl in a pub. And then you waited for the offers to come in. And I started meeting men in the park because I thought that was the safest thing because I didn't, I didn't know them. I didn't know them. And I thought, I don't know you. I just go to the park and I'll meet you and we'll have a nice chat. And the first man I met was like a, just the sweetest, most campus uh, man uh, they called Simon. And he was just like, I thought they all wanted money. I thought the idea was you paid them. You had to save up £2,000 and I'd saved up £2,000 for this. And the idea was they marry you and they come to the home office with you. I mean... If you're listening and you're at the home office, this is obviously your comedy fiction. <laughs> so I, I went the sweet, the campest man in the world called Simon, and he said, I don't want your money, I don't want your money. I think it's very sad that you can't say, I don't want your money, I just want you to meet my mother, because she just wants a wedding, and she just wants me around, and she just wants to, she just, I, just can, I'm nev- I can never come out to my mother, it would break her heart. I was like, honey, your mother knows. <laughs> And all, he was obsessed with the dress. I was like, you, this is just going to be a little registry office wedding. Oh, no, 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 no. And he'd, he'd planned the big day. He was like showing me pictures of sweetheart necklines. I was like, nobody, nobody, nobody. We could have sex on the cake. Nobody would think, what? Um, and then the next man I met was uh, sort of more straight acting, if that's contemporary inclusive language. But he said he was a hairdresser from Cornwall and he said, this, uh, this guy found out I was gay and he's threatening to tell my boss. And so I need to go down there with a wife. You need to come down six or seven times. Then I'll say we've split up and that'll be fine. And I was like, someone's blackmailing you. He said, oh, no, 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 no. He sort of sorted that situation out now. This is just for the future so it can never happen again. I said, how did you sort out the blackmailing? He said, oh, I had his legs broken. <laughs> I was like, I can't say no to this man now. I can't say no to this man now. Now I can't. I'm like, I value both of my legs. And I was like, what am I going to do? So I rang him. Because I also thought, who cares if a hairdresser is gay? But he said, no, in Cornwall they do. Um, <laughs> if you're listening in Cornwall, please write in and tell me if that is still the case. I don't know. This was the 90s. I was like, oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? So I thought, I just rang him and I told him my sister was pregnant in Australia and I was needed to go home so I wasn't able to stay in this country after all because I needed a full escape route out. If you're listening to this, hairdresser in Cornwall, that's a different person. Um, <laughs> so in the meantime, I started seeing this nice guy at my improv group and I was driving him home and he was telling me about his problems. He's having his fiance, and he said they were beating a dead horse and that he was always sort of, you know sadly telling me about that then and then one day he rang me and said uh, he'd broken up with the fiance but he'd got a basket of kittens and would I like to come and look at the kittens because in the late 90s before the internet if you wanted to look at kittens you had to buy them and that was how he he had no he had no game in a nightclub and that's how he got me to come he just thought I'll buy some kittens and that will lure they'll come and he wasn't wrong and uh so I'd started seeing this guy and in the meantime I'd found this really lovely bisexual man who was just adorable he was very nice looking had piercing blue eyes and he said I want to marry he's a friend of a friend he said I'm going to marry you just because I think people should be able to live where they want to live I don't want anything and I was like oh my god so I said to this guy I was seeing by the way nothing to be alarmed about because we've only been going out three weeks I said we've been going out three weeks I said nothing to be alarmed about but I'm marrying someone else and he said that doesn't sound like the least alarming thing I've ever heard and I said don't worry he's gay it's just a handshake thing and he said how gay is he and I said bisexual and he said that's not gay enough which it isn't but it was the 90s and we weren't very inclusive yet we didn't understand everything now all of that obviously has to go um so Anyway, he said, no, 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 I'll marry you. And I said, you can't marry me. You can't marry me. That's a terrible idea because we're going out. And I can't marry someone I'm falling in love with. That would be a disaster. I said, it'll just break us up. I'm just looking for a nice gay man to marry me. It's fine. And he said, no, I don't want anyone else to marry you. And I don't want to take you to the airport. And they're my other two choices. I am going to marry you. Listener, I married him. Um, And then what we were going to do was tell nobody. Well, he insisted we tell our parents. That's how young we were. He said, we better tell our parents. He said, my parents will be fine. They read The Guardian. I said, they won't. (laughs) He said, no, they're very liberal. He went, it doesn't matter how often your parents read The Guardian. They don't want you marrying someone they've never met in the morning. And... (laughs) 
they were like, oh, she's a con artist. What are you doing? Tom's father said if he could find out where the wedding was, he'd come and stop it. When the registrar said, does anyone know of any reason why these two people should not get married, our friends looked at the door, (laughs) expecting Tom's father to come through. We were going to take the rings off and tell nobody except the couple of friends we'd had there as witnesses. But Tom just kept not taking the ring off. And we just kind of got more and more married. And eventually our friends would go, when are you going to get married? And we'd be like, oh, we kind of already are. And we'd sort of come out to people as married. Um, Some of our older friends who were like, when are you going to make an honest woman? I'm like, we're the only people who are pretending to be living in sin in the history of the world. Um, So eventually we did have a proper wedding because I think in those years people thought we were married, but I didn't feel feel we were because we hadn't said the vows properly. Tom always said he had, but I said, you couldn't have. Like, we've been going out together for a few weeks. But he always maintained that he sort of just knew at the time. Anyway, on the weekend, we went to a wedding. And I, we were sitting there. It was a lovely wedding. And we were sitting in the corner having a nice chat, eating some cake. And I said, if you got married again, would you do the whole big thing again, the whole big party? And he said, well, if I got married to you again, because to be fair, he has married me twice. <laughs> and I said, no, like if, if you married someone else. And he said, well, why am I marrying someone else? I said, because I've died or <laughs> run off with John Hamm. <laughs> and he went... Well, I hope it's the latter. He said, I hope you've run off with John Hamm. I hope you haven't died. And I said, would you rather that I ran off with John Hamm than died? And he said, yes, of course. Aww. And I said, and he, he said, if you'd run off with John Hamm, like, I'd be really pleased for you, you know. And he said, <laughs> I said, <laughs> he said, and I'd, I'd watch you on the television and I'd say, she's great. I used to be married to her. <laughs> And I was like, oh my God, that's so lovely. I said, if you got married again to someone else, would you invite me to the wedding? He said, of course. I said, what if she didn't want me there? And she, he said, well, who is she? Why doesn't she like you? I said, I don't like her if she doesn't like you. I said, she might not understand that. She said, well, I'm not marrying her then. And he said, would you invite me to your wedding? I said, yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah I, think, I, think, I, think, I think so. I mean, I think, I think John Hamm would have to be all right. I think he'd understand... And he said, well, if you don't invite me to your next wedding, look out for the waiter with the long beard and the mysterious Eastern European accent. <laughs> and I said, this is why I will never leave you for John Hamm. <laughs> because we have our own special brand of romance <laughs> that while over the years has been indecisive in its way, keeps meaning I will always come back to you and I will always decide on you. Thank you very much. today (laughs) are an award-winning actor and playwright and the founder of the pro-choice organization Sister Supporter. Please welcome to the stage the wonderful Sadie Hassler and the fantastic Anna (laughs) Veglio-White. Start with the most important thing. Yes, Tom, I would marry you. Um, (laughs) You've sort of found yourself a Tom now, haven't you, though? George is much of a Tom. George is my Tom. George is your Tom. George is currently in the dressing room with Sadie's baby, and they're watching Sadie on the monitor, and he's saying, look, there's Mummy on the television. Can you just wave at Maisie, because she'll be on the... Where's the the camera with the monitor on it? I don't know where the camera is. There must be a camera somewhere here. It's is there a hidden right. camera? It's back somewhere. There. Is it there? Is it just it's back there? Oh, it's back there. No there. waving. Okay, wave at Maisie. Everyone say hello, Maisie. <laughs> Hi. Yes. Is this oh. a really bad time to bring up the fact she's called Marcy? <gasps> I saw her. <laughs> she's the fucking godmother. I'm so sorry. That's the godmother. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's my other friend's baby. I'm so sorry. My other friend's baby is called Maisie, and I was talking to her today. I'm Marcy's godmother. What I'm a so bitch. sorry. I'm so sorry. I genuinely do have another friend with a baby called Maisie. I'm quite named dyslexic. You cannot criticize me as a disability. I'm, I'm named dyslexic. I am, I'm so sorry, Hesedi. I'm never, I'll never ever forget this moment. It's the worst moment. I nearly, no, I nearly called Marcy Maisie in the dressing room because I was self-correcting from earlier today. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I'm so- I cannot breathe. I I'm can't so breathe. Sorry. I can't breathe. I feel so bad about this. I'm so, 
genuinely, genuinely, I'm going to put you in touch with the other friend. So you can see this is true. I'm her godmother. I feel so bad about it. Are you I can Macy's remember this godmother too? No, too? I'm not Macy's godmother. What the hell? I'm, I just... I'm quite name dyslexic. I do it all the time. All right. I mean, but, babies do all look the same. But I mean, yours no, is no, very she precious. Doesn't look at, like, the same. No, that's irrelevant to the story. It's just I am a bit face blind and I'm definitely name dyslexic. I do it all the time. If there are two. Oh, they literally all. Deborah but I'll do it to my own. I do it to like my own sister. I'll call her <laughs> the name of the person, last person I was talking yeah, to. Sisters, goddaughters, Maisies, whatevs. They're all <laughs> the same. That's fine. You're meant to be supporting me. I'm so sorry. That, I mean. Go on. To explain to Sadie why... Those are very similar names. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I'll probably forget later. And if you so wanted I'm people sorry. to remember I'm your baby's name, person. then could you should have named say, it something else. Could ever... <laughs> <laughs> if you want people to remember your baby's name, you got to come up with something more original. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about it. Sorry. I'm just a terrible person. We no. have... No, I am. I am. I'm a terrible person, and I just. I feel like you're being super hard on yourself. Can we have a show yeah. of hands where everyone who's forgotten an important person in their life's name? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I mean, right. my mother has never called me my name. <laughs> she goes, Ellen, Peter, Tim. That's her husband. <laughs> uh, the first one. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine. Thank you. Nice. Sadie, Solidarity. tell us a little bit about yourself. My name is Sadie. Um, got that? Sadie has Sadie. Did you write Sadie. That down? My name is Sadie. Sadie. <laughs> <laughs> if you could, could just jot that down. Oh, got it. <laughs> She's fucking jotting it down. <laughs> I got it. I Sadie got it. Sadie Hassler. Sadie. Yeah. Sadie Hassler. And uh, I'm a playwright and columnist and actor. And um, feeling quite uncomfortable for you at the moment. <laughs> Anna, tell me about you. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's tricky to scoot straight from that into abortion. But um, <laughs> um, I, you don't have to learn their names. <laughs> you want to just do it. Uh, just hard and fast. Um, I'm a pro-choice activist, and I founded an organisation called Sister Supporter, and we got the UK's first ever buffer zone outside my local abortion clinic because people are paid to stand outside and by whatever means they see necessary try and dissuade people from going in and talking about indecision I think it's very odd that these people who live a life that's very different to lots of people in the UK think they are the people who are best placed to help complete strangers decide what to do and we had a really exciting day today because there was a appeal at the High Court and the High Court this lovely old white man weirdly enough ruled in our favour so the buffer zone stays <laughs> It's a nice white man, yay! <laughs> it's, it's so bad, because I know loads of them, and yet when you said lovely old white man, I was like, this will be sarcasm. Yeah, no, it was, it was nice. very hard for me to say, but I felt like I should just give this listen, one credit, because it's today. Tomorrow I'll forget about him, old and I'll be annoyed. Yeah, right. listen, who some knew? Of my, some of my some favourite <laughs> husbands are straight white men. <laughs> but I know loads of... Who doesn't love a straight white... We all love so oh. many straight white men. Yeah. See, my boyfriend's it's, a straight white man. I don't like I'm so sorry. <laughs> I mean, you know, listen, the problem with white straight men is not them as individuals, it's that the power structures favour straight white men, but as individuals, as this man showed, they can be yeah. charmers yeah. And, yes. and, and allies. Yeah, and allies. Mr Judge, who I now feel really bad because I can't remember his name. <laughs> See, it happens! Um, <laughs> it it happens! Are you that old man's godmother? Though? <laughs> no, no, in all fairness, I don't, I don't know him, so I feel like it's more yeah, okay. Yeah, sure, than, sure, but than it's good. Yeah. It should be, that should be a system. If you can say Mr. Judge, Madam Baby. Baby. <laughs> no can we all offended. say hello, Madam Baby? Oh, God, this is getting funny now. It's going to have to stay in. <laughs> I don't want it to stay in. Everyone's going to hate me and we No, okay. they're not. I don't mind about everyone hating me. I'm Marcy's fairy godmother, and I'm now going to get minus... Wind. Yeah, I'm going to get deep winged. That's what's going to I'm going to take the pressure off and just let George decide after. Oh. <laughs> oh. Do, do you want your child? Because I'm indecisive, so I couldn't make a call like that. <laughs> <laughs> so you're just going to hand the decision making back to the man. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. And then blame him forever. Nice, nice, nice. Tell me about your play, um, because you have two plays that are now 
going all over the world, both of which I found very poignant, but especially Prime Kicker. I was someone who was indecisive about having a baby for a long time because I couldn't have a baby the traditional way and I needed a lot of help. The sort of decision for me was, do I spend years trying to do this artificially? And so I saw your play, Pram Kicker, when I was in a very, very emotional state. And it was a play about a woman who did not want a baby and felt society was against her. And another woman, her sister, who isn't sure if she wants a baby and genuinely doesn't know and is in this indecision. This is before you had Marcy. Mm -hmm. That play is now going on around the world, is that not? It is. Where's it going? It has been on in Washington, D.C. It's going back to Washington, D.C. for another company... Um, it's been in Rome, uh, it's going to Sydney, and Fran and Lenny, my other play, which is about girl punks, is on in New York uh, at some point. And I'm really shit on the details, so I can't even plug it, sorry. But, <laughs> and it's called Pram Kicker. Pram Kicker. Yeah. Check it out, it's an absolutely amazing play. Um, but in that play, I felt like you were able to sort of embody this sort of indecision around... The desire to procreate, and as a cis woman, it is not as easy as it is, I think, for a cis man because of the nature of biology, the yeah. baby growing in your... If you have a uterus and the baby wants to live in it, and then it wants to be a parasite inside of you, basically. Yeah. And then it Very wants good science. science. <laughs> and then, listen, if the baby's moved in, what are you going to do? <laughs> but it does it's a parasite inside of you and sometimes and it feels like that and you're like what is it get out and then it does yeah. come out and then it wants to mm. feed on you still um, I hear yeah. I hear yeah. then it still wants to literally suck you suck dry. you dry oh. yeah and that's a lot that's a lot and so that's a really really big decision and I think it's such a feminist play for that reason because I think it's something that contemporary women and feminists often struggle with. It's like, just out of a, just on a mm, level, if you feel in two minds about having children because you worry about your life being taken over or your feminism being disrupted, just go, hmm? Mm. If you're absolutely in a mind that, yes, I do want children, go, hmm? I don't want children, go, hmm? That's interesting. Mm. Catherine, you and Anna, do you feel this too, that I always envy people who are decisive about this? Massively, yeah. And I think in a really weird other way, being a pro-choice activist, I think people really assume that if I do get pregnant and I'm quite young, that I would just have an abortion and I feel that pushed on me as well. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. Would I? Should I? I don't know. <laughs> it's kind of that weird think... flip side of it. And I, yeah, I really, even getting lunch, I don't know what to get, so... I really envy <laughs> decisive people. Just as you said, people would assume that I'd get an abortion. I could just hear my Irish mother being like, isn't England mad? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, do you know something? I think it's such a difficult decision to make because, unlike most, it comes from a presumption that you will. So there's like a societal expectation and presumption that that is the natural or desired thing to it's do. It's the way of God and nature. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or that like... They're like you're hitting in a specific age so you must have an urge to do things and, and even despite like all circumstance people presume that people not only want to have children but that they must want to have them biologically so my partner and I come up against this a lot where people will go so which one of you is having the baby and you're like are we having a baby what are you <laughs> talking oh, that's about? interesting but they'll also when they ask that question because Sarah lo- like presents more traditionally masculine than I do they'll go so which one of you with the long hair and wearing the dress is having the baby? <laughs> and I'm like, absolutely not me. Whereas Sarah's like, I carry the shopping. Why wouldn't I carry the baby? <laughs> <laughs> I could carry the baby. Like, she'll end up having the baby out of like, I could have the baby. <laughs> <laughs> to prove right? a point. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Purely out of spite. But like... <laughs> I could, I could do, I could do it. Um, I'll make her last if words. If you do do that, I make an excellent godfather. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Guilty Feminist, briefly interrupting your podcast listening to let you know that the Guilty Feminist book made the Sunday Times pick of the paperbacks this week. Yay, that's right. The book's going to come out in paperback. So it's going to be much handier for throwing in a bag for public transport and also cheaper. But here's the exciting thing. It's got a whiz bang new cover and two new interviews 
from the scintillating, resplendent powerhouses that are Phoebe Waller-Bridge, creator of Fleabag and Killing Eve, and Hannah Gadsby, creator of Nanette. I know, I know, it couldn't get more exciting than that. And the interviews are even better and they're even more insightful than you would think. They really are a pair of geniuses. So if you want a copy of the paperback, it's on pre-order now from Waterstones. And Waterstones have a, a special fancy one with red edges, or you can get it in all of the other regular places. Pre-order it now. I think it's out on the 1st of May. And if you're thinking, oh, I really wish I could see a Sadie Hassler play, good news. She's got a new play called Stiletto Beach, which is upending stereotypes around Essex girls from the 4th to the 28th of September at the Queen's Theatre in Essex. And you can go to queens-theatre.co.uk to find tickets for Stiletto Beach by Sadie Hassler. Okay, now, I don't want to go on about this, but uh, we can't normally be very visual The Guilty Feminist, because it's a podcast, but this isn't a podcast. We are doing a live tour. So we're going to pitch up to the biggest theatre in a town near you. We're going to open with me in a green sequined Jedi cloak. I'm not making this up. It is going to be a completely spectacular evening. Some of your favourite Guilty Feminist comedians are coming with me and we're going to slam down some serious feminist comedy We're going to have the I'm a Feminist Butts. We're going to have the stand-up comedy. We're going to have the music. But also, in each town, we are having on stage, as guests, local feminists who are making a difference in their local area. So there'll be somebody that you can connect with, get involved with, whether that could be hashtagging donations or actual volunteering hand-to-hand contact. So please come out and join us. It's going to be like Feminist Church don't miss it. Guiltyfeminist.com and you'll be able to see all the tour dates there. And Belfast, we know we haven't been to you. We've had so many emails and tweets saying, please come to Belfast. And finally, 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 we have booked in a podcast recording there on the 8th of June. Go to guiltyfeminist.com to get tickets. All right, back to the podcast. Would you like to hear some stand-up comedy? Yeah. Then please welcome to the stage the wonderful Catherine Bohart. Yeah. So I spend a lot of my time being told to make up my mind, specifically because I'm a bisexual lady. Any in? Yeah. <laughs> There's like statistically some liars in, guys. <laughs> but okay, you do you. Uh, Yeah, now, cards on the table. I tend to say I'm gay rather than saying I'm bi, which is awful. I know it makes me a terrible ally to the cause, but I just find it's easier, right? Because if I say I'm gay, then women know I'm interested and men try harder. So there's just (laughs) a wonderful consistency there, isn't there? Um, Yeah, I would say the three most common responses I get to saying I'm a bisexual woman are in this order. The first one tends to be no. No, your hair's too long. <laughs> I don't know if you know, guys. There is a test and I failed. So um, the uh, second one I think is a very common one. Uh, you're making the other bridesmaids uncomfortable. <laughs> yep, standard, standard bisexual stuff. Yep, yep. And then the third one is make up your mind some variation of make up your mind. We were talking about it a little bit earlier, but like a lot of people want to know what percentage (laughs) gay you are. You say you're bi and people go, yeah, but like what what numbers are we talking? (laughs) Kind of numbers are, what's the numbers game? Because you haven't made up your mind, but I could do the math and make up my mind for you. (laughs) And you're like, well, if you say 50-50, their mind just goes, what? I'm broken. So people love to do that for you. Now, I think to be fair, two of my favorite reactions to telling people I'm bi was one, when I was growing up, I lived in quite a Catholic uh, part of Ireland, uh, by which I mean any part of (laughs) Ireland, of course I guess. And you'd say you were bi and people would say they didn't believe in it. They didn't believe in it, which I always think is remarkable, right? Because a lot of their contention for not believing in bisexuality would be that they didn't have any proof of it. Now, from ardently Catholic people, You'd think the one thing they'd be practiced at is believing in things they have zero proof of. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? 
Also, when the people talking to you are your family members, proof is not something you want to provide of your sex life. <laughs> I think I'll just pass, thanks very much. Um, but also, do you know what it is? I think a lot of the time people think the terms and conditions of bisexuality are confusing, right? So that's, maybe you haven't made up your mind, but they can't really get their heads around it because the terms and conditions are not clear. My dad has this trouble with bisexuality. He doesn't really understand it. And I get that, right? For his generation of people, it can be confusing. Because with lesbians, for example, and I'm a big fan, my girlfriend's one, love your work, top group of girls. Um, <laughs> any lesbians in? Yes, good. Okay, but I, yeah, you guys have a clear culture, right, that my dad can reasonably understand, because he can go, okay, five aside, you wear a lot of super dry. <laughs> you elected your leader, Ellen DeGeneres. He knows where he stands, right? Two out of three, he does those two. Fine. <laughs> I can already hear the tweets. Okay. Uh, and straight people, any straight people in? It's okay, you can be loud and proud, come on. <laughs> Big straight night out. But you guys have a culture too, don't you? You have um, pregnancy scares and, um, <laughs> and car boot sales. So, you know, fair dues. But my dad can understand that, right? What he can understand is bisexuals, and that's because they don't have a clear culture of their own, so I'm trying to start one if anyone wants to join me. Thinking of, yes, thank you. Thinking of going to football matches and supporting both teams. Have <laughs> you got a restaurant to so just order everything on the menu because we don't see flavor, we just see food, right? <laughs> but it is interesting to me that so many people are like, well, listen, you don't know, so we'll just go on what you are in front of us, right? So I'm with a woman, and so whenever people meet me now, they'll be like, okay, you're with a woman, and if I'm with a woman, I'm a lesbian, and if I'm with a man, then I'm a straight woman, regardless of anything I say to the contrary, right? Which is amazing. It's like being an Irish person and saying you're not Catholic. People are like, mm-hmm. <laughs> you're like, no, 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 like genuinely, I'm an atheist. They're like, sure. <laughs> but you eat Easter eggs and we're christened, so okay. <laughs> And you're like, no, seriously, though. But yeah, so I'm a bisexual lady. Made up my mind. Not going to choose. Big, big fan of both or of all. I will cards on the table admit, and this is something I'm going to admit, and then I'm going to sit down. I am a bisexual lady. I do like all of the flavors. Um, <laughs> but I don't necessarily know the difference between being bisexual and pansexual. What I know is that I love Janelle Monet. <laughs> Does that make it okay? <laughs> this lady's face says no, no, <laughs> and that's okay. Folks, uh, you've been lovely. Uh, I'm indecisive. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>
I would go back and make a firm decision earlier. Yeah. I, I don't know that I agree with that. I kind of feel like indecision permits you to deal with what's in front of you. So, like, you're given circumstances and then you can make a decision around that. Whereas often if you make a decision like, I'm going to have a baby, and then that does or does not happen, it feels like you might not be, like, conscious of the circumstances that you're dealt. But yeah. also, like, I feel like men get the privilege of indecision. Like, I'll see. And I understand the argument that, like, and, like, the fact that at some point your body will go, time's up. But I also feel like there are multiple ways to have families, and that's not, we're well, not that necessarily bound to the... Uh, but we're so obsessed with the need for it to be biological... Mm. Or, or for it to look like we've been sold it. Yeah. Because the yeah. thing is now, because I didn't have a baby and I knocked through upstairs, I ended up with a spare room. Yeah. And some of the listeners will know. that was know. a metaphor, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> in my flat. <laughs> in London. In, if you're listening outside London, you may not realise there's, there's not a lot of room here. And so you have to find, like, a Narnia attic in your ceiling, which we did, and we knocked through. And that meant we went... Our bedroom was upstairs. So suddenly we had... It was meant to be my room for one's own workspace. But some regular listeners will know that what happened instead was I met a lovely Syrian refugee on a podcast I do called Global Pillage, and he manned my cat and then didn't leave. He's sort of become... Weirdly, I'm not old enough to be his mother, but I sort of describe him to people as a younger brother, but actually, in reality, I feel about him like he's my grown-up son. So when people meet him, they say, oh, he's terribly handsome, and I go, I honestly feel like going, yes, don't you just want to leave me property in your will? Um, <laughs> I feel like when I see my mother being proud of my brother being handsome, more talented, or, you know, clever, that's how I feel about Steve. And today, we were talking... And I realised, like, how, especially if you live in a city, how untraditional your family can be. You can build this unbelievably untraditional family. And what I love about it is there's no model. There's no what good looks like for being a weird comedy freelance couple with a Syrian refugee in the bedroom. Yeah. It's like, what is that? I'm not looking at a sitcom and going, well, that's how it should be. Yeah. Um, I would watch that sitcom, to be fair. <laughs> but I think it's actually, there's one coming to Channel 4. Um, there is, there is, course, there is. There is. Um, there is. But this morning, we were talking and something came up about, there was something, it was a story in The Guardian or something about euthanasia. And Steve, because he's lived in the jungle, is extremely adept He's like Morgan Freeman in The Shawshank Redemption. He can get you things. So I said... <laughs> I said... He lived in the Calais jungle, just to be clear, not the jungle jungle. There was a strange link from euthanasia. I thought you were going to be like, he's pretty good at killing the elderly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just feel oh. like he knows how to get things. So I said, if I'm ever in a situation where I want euthanasia and it's not legal, will you sort me out? And he was like, what? He was like, I don't know how to do euthanasia. I was like, I'm just saying, you know... It's what my mother says to me. I've realised I've become my mother. And I said, <laughs> if I'm in a home and I'm really unhappy, and he looked at me and said, oh, you'll never be in a home. And he said, no, no. He said, Arabic sons don't put their mothers in homes. Like, it's not... And I was like, oh, my God. And he said, but the thing is, this is true. There's a cultural thing. He said, in the Arabic world, if you put your parents in a home, it's a shame. Like, you look after your parents. And I was like, Steve, you have your own parents to look after. He said, well, I'll do both. And I was like, I really felt like crying, but also like saying, I'm not old enough to be your mother. <laughs> Can we not? But it's so lovely. And I just suddenly, this is true, I just went, if I'd had a baby, I wouldn't have had Steve. Because I wouldn't have had the room in my life or in my house. So in that moment, I went, that decision was a good decision. Yeah, because but I didn't know why. You literally get taken care of in your old age, but you never have to change a nappy. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. He may have to. <laughs> um. <laughs> Can I ask, because we've just had Repeal the Eighth in Ireland, and... Um, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. That was all me, guys. Uh, <laughs> But I feel like there's sort of been an undue burden of total decisiveness put on women around the topic of abortion. Because we often say, like, I know what you mean when you say you envy someone who has a totally decisive mentality. Yeah. But I feel like 
that characterization of women in those situations is not one that is actually universal, where people are like, well, obviously I'm going to do this, but rather a bunch of circumstances and situations and life choices have brought them to that place. And then you're not really allowed to waver without looking like you're in some way diminishing your position or full of... like. There were so many articles in Irish papers. Uh, I did inverted commas because they'd be things like, I had an abortion and now I regret it, so basically if you do, you're the worst. Um, I don't think those were the actual captions, but just... No, yeah. And so like, I feel like you're not allowed to have any sort of indecision around this particular choice. Yeah, I, it's so nuanced and I think the stuff that society puts on pregnant women who are going through with their pregnancy, people who don't want to go through with their pregnancy have the same thing. And I think the providers like BPAS and Mary Stokes are amazing because you have counselling and you can choose either way. But I think it's really weird that people have this kind of like ownership over anyone who is pregnant and the decision that they're going to make. And also it's a very time-sensitive situation, mm -hmm. which is also what makes the harassment outside clinics so bad because lots of people will just walk away and then book a later appointment, but then there's certain time limits. So like the health effects that that indecisiveness yeah. can have and mm. the harassment has is pretty huge as well. The harassment is there to try and create indecision in the person, I, isn't I it? I think they're trying to coerce someone out of the decision they've made or if someone's maybe undecided and I think what we've seen going through this process is the people who are largely effective are people who are undocumented because you have no rights here if you are not a citizen and have, you have no access to healthcare aside from an abortion which is obviously a terrible thing because that decision is then to a certain extent being made for you so these are the people who are very vulnerable and kind of end up in the hands of these almost kind of like cult-like groups in these really awful kind of crisis pregnancy centres where they'll play you a video where it's like, oh, if you have an abortion, you're never having kids and you're going to become anorexic. And it's like, what? <laughs> How did that happen? They put such immense pressure and kind of all these lies and stuff about you're going to get breast cancer and stuff and you shouldn't do this. And if you are slightly undecided and you are vulnerable and maybe English isn't your first language that can really have a huge effect on your decision. If you think, oh, I'm not going to get help from the government, well, then this is the path to go down. But then, of course, actually, if you actually make it into the centre, they can refer you to kind of government-vetted, unbiased services who can help you then make an impartial decision. But it's such an emotive subject, and people can be very, very powerful if they really believe in something. I think that can really affect people's decision. So, Sister Supporter, your Sister Supporter Ealing... Yeah. Are there sister supporters around the country? There are. We franchised after Ealing. So we have Manchester, which is amazing. We have one starting in Warren Street, also Bristol and Portsmouth. This is, I mean, it's an issue that affects over 40 clinics. So there's this amazing thing in Ealing, but that's one clinic. So do there you still need women. more help on different clinics? We do, please. Where do, you, <laughs> where, where do you need help? We need help in London, uh, Manchester, Portsmouth, Bristol, and also now Scotland, Glasgow, if you have any Scottish listeners. If you go to our website, there's a little volunteer button. You can send us an email and tell us where you're from, and then we can tell you how best you can help us. But also, if you're like an amazing writer and can write press releases, or you know lots about policy... Sadie, you're an amazing writer. <laughs> Thanks, babe. <laughs> Then that'd be great. Also, Sudhi David is being really, really unhelpful. Amber Rudd um, launched this huge review into harassment outside abortion clinics, and it was ready to go, and then she was really awful with Windrush, and she had to leave, and Sudhi David has not published the findings of this report, and he will not publish, and I think it's not something he wants to be involved with. I don't think he wants to be the guy who gets buffer zones around abortion. And if you're zone. listening internationally, this is our Home Secretary. Yeah, sorry, Home um, Secretary. So we need help changing policy as well. Yes, please. So on the BPAS website, there's a link where you can send a letter to Sajid Davids. If we get loads of letters, write to your MP, ask them to badger Sajid David. That would be great. great. So where are the places we go? If we want to support you either with funds or with volunteering? Yep, sistersupporter.co.uk. Sistersupporter.co.uk. And if we want to write to our MP or the Home Secretary, we go to... The uh, BPAS Back Off campaign. And internationally, there will be something like this probably in your regional country. Um, so Google Absolutely. it and get yeah. involved. Uh, because it's really awful if you've made a yeah. decision or you're mm. going there to just talk about what your options are, yeah. actually. A lot of people who get harassed haven't made a decision, mm -hmm. but you're walking in and you're being screamed and you're being shouted yeah. at. And it's, it's unacceptable. They call every woman mum, which is something that I think uh, is the most... Uh, wow. I hate uh, anybody being called mum unless it's... that 
child. Their or choice. The, yes. Yeah. I would, when yeah. it said, well, would mum like to come through and sit down? It's just like, shut up. <laughs> it's like when people call my husband, and I'm going to have to add it to my mouth. <laughs> Is hubby coming? Oh. Fuck you. <laughs> fuck you. Fuck you. I become irrational. I become unfeminist because it doesn't matter if it's a feminist saying it to me. I would be like, yeah. what are you saying? Firstly, hubby, horrible word. Secondly, are you talking about my husband? And that's what I will say. I will say, do you mean my husband, Tom Zielinski? <laughs> Is that what you mean? Is he Full coming? title. <laughs> Exactly. That's interesting. Whereas I call my girlfriend my husband all the time, but I guess that's just for lols. That, that's fine. That's your... You can call your person, your significant other, anything you fucking like. Yeah. But if somebody I mean, said... she doesn't like it, but I do it. So it's like, <laughs> is wifey coming? Fuck off. Yeah, fair yeah. enough. That's gross. Um, that's really grim. <laughs> Sadie, your play, which I believe is required watching slash reading for anybody who is either in two minds about having a baby or would like to understand more about the indecision that goes on or the feeling that a woman gets when she's decided she doesn't want to have a baby and then society is sort of telling her that she's less important than people who do have babies you're writing this into a novel is that true yeah yeah i'm gonna um try and attempt to sit down and write with a baby stuck to my tit (laughs) <laughs> I feel that Marcy is going to be a very helpful writer's assistant. Um, and Otherwise, you'll just be doing a lot of babysitting I'm to make very, up for tonight. I'd be very happy. I don't say that. <laughs> I've been such a good godmother so you. far. I love you. You've been wonderful. You have I've truly to been Essex. wonderful. I don't... I mean... And She's people, come to Essex. People who live in London understand what You've that means. You've gone to Essex. <laughs> I've gone all the way to I'm Essex. I'm amazed you talk to me. I live in the province. I've gone to Essex. I've got a train, and then the train stopped, so I had to get out and get an Uber. <laughs> from Basildon. I got an Uber from Basildon. I mean, You're that's, the kind, of, that's the kind of commitment I have to being godmother. Yeah. If anyone's looking for a godmother, I'm just yeah. saying. Denise did, is available. I Absolutely. sent biscuits in a merry-go-round box that goes round and she round. Did. I was actually looking at monogrammed baby clothes today because there's a thick company where they'll put the name on. Luckily. M. Luckily. Luckily, I didn't order any with the wrong name. Um, I was saying the right name when I was putting it. I would really like to read this book and I think it's a really important book. Is the book going to have more of the sort of interior of the heads of the characters? I think I'm going to flip between the two characters. So Jude, who knows she has never wanted children, and Susie, her sister, who is unsure. She's waiting for the, you know, like a lot of us, the right circumstances and the right, you know, time of her life, but she knows that that she hasn't got long to wait. And there, without giving a spoiler, there's a a big bit about abortion in it. But, yeah, it was really cathartic for me to write because... (laughs) Because, you know, there's some personal history there with that subject and um, to then go from that on to having a baby, obviously there's a lot for me to re-explore personally Mm. with how I feel about that now that I have had a baby. Still completely pro-choice, obviously, but just there's different emotional clangers going on. Yeah, so I kind of want to re-explore everything, really, and just turn it into a book. Well, I really can't wait till it's out. I can't wait to read it. That's Pram Kicker, and if you are somewhere where Pram Kicker is coming near to you, or the amazing play about two women in punk, Fran and Lenny, please find them. Or you can actually, if you'd like to buy the plays and read them, uh, they're available in any good bookshop. I know that it was very helpful for me in sort of becoming more decisive about what I wanted to do, and it turns out what I wanted to do was adopt a grown Syrian man. Um, everyone to their own. You're welcome, listen. Steve. <laughs> everyone to their own. Oh, it's true, though. I wouldn't have him otherwise. Catherine, do you have anything to plug for I'm this episode? I'm doing an Edinburgh show for all of August at 4.15 at the Pleasance. It's called Immaculate, and I'll be there every day. Great. Whether it's good or bad. <laughs> Super. One last plug. Sistersupporter.co.uk. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Mailchimp. <laughs> Everything. Mailchimp. <laughs> Brilliant. And one last plug for you, Sadie. Is there anything else we should look at? Any of your writing? Uh, you, can, you can just go on to sadiehasler.com and look at various things. Great. And if you are listening and you would like to support something of mine, go to globalpillage.net uh, or Grown Up Land, uh, BBC Radio 4. A big round of applause for Anna Veglio White! <laughs> Yeah. 
You have been listening to the Guilty Feminists with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co host Catherine Bohart, and our very special guests, Sadie Hassler and Anna Figlio White. The recording engineer was Chris Sharp. The music was by Mark Hodge. The producer was Tom Solitsky for the Spontaneity Shop. Thanks to Zoe, Jacob, Sally, and everyone at King's Place, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. Thank you very much. I've been Deborah Francis White. That's our show. Good night. She's going to gently, <laughs> gently bring you down the other side. Where to am fade. I, when am I bringing them down? Well, you'll sort of here. We'll make eye contact. Oh. <laughs> you know, okay. the, I, mean, I think you think I can pick up cues better than I can, but fine. Let's. <laughs> Let's give it a whirl. We can try it. I mean... My girlfriend would say, you're wrong, but let's try. Let's try. So I was going to say, when you normally bring someone to climax, you don't say, when do I... It's more of an eye, it's more of an eye contact thing, right? It's not like, well... could you give me the exact... I need to know a time frame. I mean, you just described lesbian sex. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm going to need to know when this is going to be done, because I have a lot of ironing to do. No, I don't. Hello, hello, hello. It's Deborah here from The Guilty Feminist, and I'm here with Erin in Oxford at my alma mater, Oxford University. Hello, Erin. Hi. We're here at the Morden Street OG and Cinema because I'm here for a screening of Say My Name uh, to do a QA and a at the end. And I happen to see on Twitter um, that Erin is a student here who excitingly got accepted for a PhD. Yeah. Uh, so could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so um, I'm currently doing my master's here um, in education, looking specifically at higher education policy. Um, really enjoy my studies. Um, I wanted to continue them and do some research. Um, so I applied to do a DPhil, looking at how working class students um, at university kind of experience and manage their identity um, through the kind of process of social mobility. What drew you to study social mobility in education? So um, I grew up in South London um, in a working class single parent family. Um, I am a mixed race person and I got into Cambridge University as an undergraduate student. Um, but a lot of my studies of education kind of reminded me or reinforced the idea that I wasn't actually supposed to be there. Um, and whilst there's kind of policy trying to change that, um, I felt somewhat interested, somewhat angered um, by the fact that statistics show that university, let alone an elite institution like Oxbridge, isn't for me. Um, and there is policy trying to change that, and it's great, and people are doing loads of really amazing work, um, and I've done some of that work before coming here to do my master's. Um, but what I really want to work on and really analyse is how these spaces can be more inclusive, um, more accepting and more accessible to these students. Um, it's great that they are gaining entry, um, but there's very little support once you're here. Um, and I experienced that myself. Um, I kind of struggled a lot as a student there, both academically with my identity, um, just with things that other people maybe found easier because they were white or privately educated or... Um, so what, what kind, what's an example? <laughs> Is it just the way you feel when you walk into a room? Is it the way that you're spoken to? Are there assumptions made about what oh, you should know or yeah. about what you do know? I would say all of those things. Um, <laughs> in one of my first lectures um, on education, um, the lecturer said, oh, middle class parents are more likely to read to their children, just like your parents would have. Um, and I remember feeling really, I guess, shocked um, because I was like, okay, well, one, I don't have two parents. Two, I'm not middle class. Am I supposed to be here? Um, and for an academic to make that assumption about who was in the room um, mm. just made me think... And also who reads to their children yeah. as well. Yeah. As plenty of working class people exactly. read to, to their children. And whether someone reads to me or not shouldn't be... I don't know. Um, but it just kind of made me think, like, am I supposed to be here? Mm. Um, am, I, am I included in the group yeah. that's being addressed? Yeah. Um, and it's kind of like this person is responsible for my education. This person is... And your state of me. mind, Yeah. yeah. And they are deciding who has access and who doesn't or who should. Um, so, yeah, I just, there are loads of experiences like that, both from academics um, or from, you know, your own peers. Um, and I really want to work towards making this a space um, that's a lot more inclusive. So um, you went to university in Cambridge. Yeah. You're now doing a master's in Oxford. Yeah. 
Um, I, I don't want to intimidate you listeners, but uh, just the, the, the cleverness is radiating off Erin. And she's sitting here uh, with me in a cinema cafe uh, going, OK, I've, I've, I've come in. I've felt uh, points of exclusion or peripheral inclusion. I, so it's, if it's not easy for me and I'm as clever as I am, which she is, she's not said that, but she is then how is it going to be for other people coming into these spaces? And do you think it's true that um, if you are working class or BAME um, uh, and have had a a more marginalised experience um, or BAME and working class, any combination of those, that you're less likely uh, to feel even that you can come to a place like Oxford and Cambridge? And if you're super clever... Um, it's harder for you than if somebody's just of ordinary cleverness and from a middle class or certainly privately school educated environment and perhaps, you know, just ordinary cleverness or has had loads of tutoring or um, it doesn't work that hard. Uh, Do you feel like you're, you're, that that you're more like, that the class is a bigger advantage than uh, aptitude and work ethic? A hundred percent. Um, so a lot of the reason there is um, access work and access policy that tries to encourage these students to apply is because um, for some students there is that doubt um, and that can be personal and internalised or it may be that it's actually come from their teachers who are maybe discouraging them or telling them that you know university isn't for people like us or um, Russell Brook Unis or Oxbridge isn't for people like us but if you go to um, a private school or you're in a family that really breeds that kind of confidence of course you're never going to question your right to be in that space because from a very young age you've been taught you know you have a right to it um whereas students who are either BAME particularly black students um students who are from working class backgrounds um and other marginalized groups are constantly told that they are privileged to be here they're really lucky they're one of the few who got through Um, And I think an issue is, and this is something I'd really like to look at in my research, is by defining success and social mobility as you're the very exceptional person who deserves to be here out of the rest of your Mm. class or race or whatever group that really should be marginalised and shouldn't be achieving like this. You create this narrative of having one extraordinary person who is exceptional to you know, or exceptional despite their class, despite their race. Mm. Um, and I'm, I just really worry about how that creates our understanding of success or who deserves or has right um, mm-hmm. to be in a space. Because if a person from a more privileged background gains entry, cool, they were meant to do that all along. But if someone from a more disadvantaged background does, it's something to celebrate. And that's rightly so, because there are so many structural barriers. Um, but it would be really nice to be in the position where that person isn't exceptional. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a very normal thing for someone of their background. Yes, I, I remember saying uh, at the time when Trump got in on the, on the podcast that if um, we look at someone like Michelle Obama and uh, we go, oh, see, she's uh, black and she, here she is being central to events. But if only exceptional women are included... Uh, who are BAME, then then BAME women think, oh, I have to be exceptional yeah. to be included. Yeah. That can be, honestly, it can be a sort of think, well, if I were Michelle Obama, I'd be, yeah, of course, mm-hmm. then I'd be allowed to, the, to, the, to, the, to come into the party. Mm-hmm. And I think that's true of all women uh, because of the power structures of, and the history, but far exacerbated mm-hmm. for BAME women. Um, but certainly I can relate to it as a white woman. You know, I, I, was, I was the first person in my family to go to university and um and I went to Oxford and uh I was raised in a small Australian beach town so when I got here I was really surprised even though I was a bit older when I came because I had a journey in between I was really surprised by the confidence of people that had just come out of sixth form I couldn't believe it like they would be like yeah well I think I'll direct an opera and I'm like how though but what do you mean like how do you how would you get that kind of confidence but they'd done years of choral singing and years of somehow just leadership they looked like leaders and they acted like leaders and they defied other people they i remember there was a professional choreographer in for one of our shows and there was a student who'd never done any dancing but she was saying yeah i don't think we should really do it like that and i she just had this leadership she'd been to wickham abbey and uh she 
just whatever it was. And I, I think that um, uh, I, I've sometimes said before that uh, entitlement is the residue of privilege. And we're all privileged if we're at Oxford. Some things happened in our life to separate us out, whether we're privileged with extra academic ability or whether we're privileged with a, a parent or a mentor or a teacher who said you can do it or I'll, I'll make a little bit of space so you can do it or we whatever it is or a combination of those we've all mm. we we're all privileged so it's amazing that you are using that privilege that you've managed to carve out for yourself to open the door for yeah. people who for whom that door is stuck mm -hmm. closed so you've got the phd yeah. yay or the d feel <laughs> as they say in oxford yeah. um and then what happened um so what I was hoping for was that um, in being accepted for my uh, PhD or DPhil, that um, the Department of Education um, here at Oxford uh, would put me forward to be considered funding. Um, unfortunately, they didn't. Um, That's a bit ironic, given the nature of the PhD. It is hilarious. Um, <laughs> Why did they decide not to put you up for funding? So I haven't got feedback yet. Um, in conversations, um, it may be that the impact maybe wasn't seen as as great. Uh, as, my, as other projects. Um, it could also be my academic ability. So I got a 2-1, which I'm very proud of. Um, yeah. Especially because in my final year of university, I found out I had dyspraxia. Um, oh, no. I had that all along, but... You just no, found no, out, no yeah. No one told me. Um, so, so it's I a thought, middle of a diagnosis, all of that, yeah. and you got a 2-1. Yeah. And... Um, but they kind of said, this isn't official feedback, um, but someone said, you know, if you're up against someone who has a first and who already has their master's <laughs> distinction and kind of has that academic profile already it's more likely that they'll get funding over you um i don't know if the department and i obviously don't really want to criticize them i'm grateful they gave me an offer um but i i just don't know on my whole application uh basically said hey i'm from a working class background and i want to look at working class students um there was nothing about it that suggested i might have funding um so yeah it's kind of ironic somewhat annoying well also you know again if you if you look at the reasons why somebody a bright person might get a first mm -hmm. it possibly of course. of course if you don't have to work you know yeah. and listen there's plenty of people who get first who have no yeah. little to no support um financial or family wise so i'm not saying uh that if you've got a first you didn't deserve yeah. your first but i am saying as a trend you might be able to see evidence that somebody who has more financial support from their mm -hmm. parents um more feeling that if things don't work out they can you know they can go back home and there's a there's a, a large room there or an offer in their uncle's yeah. company or you know there might be all sorts of support systems that middle class people have um for convenience financial support emotional support um future uh future proofing uh that may allow them uh more time um to and to headspace uh, to get a first. Yeah. Um, and there are clear attainment gaps based on both race and class within universities. So yeah. statistically, it's proven that you yeah. are less likely. Well, if you um, if you get if you have to work two jobs or you have yeah. to you know uh, uh, or if there are other these other pressures on yeah. you that you say when you come into the room, you don't always feel like they get that you're yeah. here uh, uh, on merit, or they make you feel a bit excluded mm -hmm. from conversations, or you know that those kind of things, you're battling this extra yeah. layer of trying to feel like you're entitled yeah. to be there. So, um, I, uh, so your project, your, your default sounds amazing. You're obviously, um, you are obviously a worthy student because you got accepted for a default at Oxford, which is, you know, to, to be accepted for a doctorate at Oxford is, is not nothing. And I need you to know listeners, there's no way I would have got accepted for that. Not in a million years. So um, I can hear the hollow laughs of my tutors as I send them yet another excuse for why I'm actually doing a play and not doing my essay again. Um, so uh, how much would it cost if as an act of feminism, we the guilty feminists wanted to raise money for you as a woman of colour from a working class background to do a defill on how people of colour and people from working class backgrounds can better be served in the education system. If we thought that was a value and we wanted to back you, Erin, what kind of money would we need to raise collectively? Um, so to cover both tuition costs as well as living costs, it's about 26000 a year. 
twenty six thousand um, a year. And okay, the course that's is three years long. The course is three years long. long. So, what does that add up to? Um, so, in total, being very specific, it's seventy eight thousand four hundred and eighty. Erin can barely get that number out of her mouth. She's so <laughs> horrified by it. But I would say that's very good value. Twenty four thousand uh, a pounds a year. 26. Sorry, twenty six thousand pounds is even is is. Is not as quite as good value as 24, <laughs> but it's really good value. Really, really. Given what it will give back to the community, yeah. to Britain as a whole, at a very difficult time, yeah. to make best practice so that working class and or BAME uh, students can feel welcome, can feel comfortable, to, to create an understanding of how we can architect these environments better um, and shape them. I think that's that's great value. I mean, if you think in the long run... The, one of the students that gets in could could, could, could be the one who ends up curing yeah. cancer yeah. or creating a more sustainable financial system or we don't know what they're going to do. We don't know. Write, write, a, write a, a, a musical that goes into the West End that's the new, the new Harry Potter or the new <laughs> Hamilton. Absolutely. We don't know what they're going to do. I think it's also important to really emphasise that this isn't just about students getting in, but students staying um, and whilst, again, there's loads of work being done to ensure students are getting into uni, um, loads are dropping out. Because um, they can't afford it. Yeah, or they, yeah. or because they're not having the best experience. Right. Um, students aren't, you know, attaining as well or getting the good grades. Students aren't going off to do the same kind of high-profile careers um, <laughs> that maybe more advantaged or middle-class students are doing because they have the connections. Like, although, you know universities are getting more diverse the gap still remains mm. um and i think it's important to emphasize that it's not just about getting in it's about getting on yeah oh that's a, that's a good that's a good turn of phrase it's not just about getting in it's about getting on and how many i know oxford's been in the press for not having enough bame students how many students of color at the moment are there in oxford do you know um i don't know about oxford um what's basically a problem is if we use the term bame is that includes anyone who is non-white um and that includes um, international students, particularly um, East Asian students from China, who make up a large proportion of that statistic. Right. So they count in foreign students who maybe have you know yeah. paid and a lot then, of money to come yeah. and and great to have them. Yeah. But it may make us think, oh, well, there's loads of yeah. um, British BAME students, yeah. and that's not the case. Yeah. So we need you here. What we need to find is for the first year. We need to find £26,000 and then once you're in doing that first year, we can worry about finding the second year's money. So all we need is £26,000. I know that sounds like a lot of money, but uh, there's a lot of Guilty Feminist listeners and many of us have great big networks of people as well. Uh, And many of us have Twitter accounts. Um, So is there a GoFundMe where we can fund you, Erin? Yes, there is. Great. Okay, well, I will get that link. I'll put it on the Guilty Feminist website, (laughs) guiltyfeminist.com. But I'll also announce it at the end of this, and it will be in the show notes from today's episode. If Have you got a pound? Because if all the guilty feminists put in a pound, we'd have way more than we needed. Uh, so a dollar, anything at all, because this the, the, the results of Erin's PhD uh, will be available to people all around the world. Um, and there will be best practice created from that wherever you are. So... Uh, so please, please, please demonstrate to Oxford University that you think this is valuable. They obviously think it's valuable because they've accepted Erin, but let's put our money where our mouth is as feminists and say, we've got you. Um, so a hashtag is get in and get on. Uh, that's and spelt out A-N-D. And we'll be spreading that along with the GoFundMe. So please help us spread the news. Uh, if you don't have anything to put in or only a little, if you could share it, um, that would be great. And if you think your company might be interested in the results of the PhD because that may help them with their graduate intake. They, you know, your company might be thinking, oh, we're not really sure how to make uh, diverse graduates feel uh, welcome and they would like to sponsor it and then have the content of it. Um, then maybe they would just pay outright uh, for one of the years. So uh, maybe ask if you're in an HR department or you work for a law firm or a bank or something like that, Um, Just say, hey, would you like to sponsor and then maybe also even employ Erin for a year in the HR department uh, to to give them advice on D&I? Would you be interested in that? Yes. (laughs) You can't see, but I'm smiling. Erin's smiling. (laughs) Erin's smiling, guilty feminist. Um, All right. So let's do a great big feminist push and see if we can raise at least one year's money so she can begin um, and then get the rest of that funding uh, kicked in um, from somewhere else. Go fund Erin. Get in 
and get on. Thanks, Erin. Now, The Guilty Feminist is going on tour. These epic shows will not be recorded, so you'll have to come and see them for yourself to know what's in them. We have a fantastic lineup of guest comedians and singers for you. Here are just a few of them. Hello, I'm Grace Petrie, and I am so excited to be joining The Guilty Feminist live tour this year. I'm going to be coming to Cardiff on the 15th of May, Cambridge on the 16th, Southampton on the 22nd, Sheffield on the 23rd, Coventry on the 24th, Plymouth on the 25th, Brighton on the 26th, Glasgow on the 29th, Leicester on the 30th, Nottingham on the 31st, and Woking on the 1st of June. I really hope to see loads of you there smashing the Patreon. Hello, I'm Catherine Bohart. This is Take 147, but here we go. I am very excited to be joining the Guilty Feminist Tour on May 19th in Oxford. It's going to be fun. It's always fun. And we always have a good time. I mean, those mean the same thing, but I've said them now. So here we are. May 19th, Oxford. See you there, hopefully. Well, hello. Um, I'm Jenny Eclair. Just checking then. I need to wear a name badge. Can't remember who I am, where I am. I'm at home at the moment. But guess what? On the 2nd of May, I won't be at home because I'm going to be in Birmingham with um, the live Guilty Feminist podcast thing on the stage. It's going to be marvellous. You're an idiot if you miss it. That's all I can say, really. Um, Be there or be square, as we used to say in the old days. (laughs) Anyway, um, I'm hugely looking forward to it. And... um, I hope you are too. Hi, I'm Mifa Queen and I'm thrilled to be joining the Guilty Feminist podcast tour in May. I'm going to be singing some songs on the following dates, Thursday the 2nd of May in Birmingham, Friday the 3rd of May in Hull, Friday the 10th of May in Colchester, Friday the 17th of May in Aylesbury and Saturday the 18th of May in Bournemouth. I'm beyond excited. It's an amazing lineup um, and can't wait to see you there. Hello, this is Jess Robinson and I am absolutely thrilled to be joining the Guilty Feminist Tour on the 1st of May in Halifax, the 4th of May in Newcastle, the 5th of May in Salford, the 11th of May in Richmond, the 12th of May in Southend and the 19th of May in Oxford. I'm absolutely over the moon. I can't wait, guys. I hope that you will all be there and we will have a wonderful time and live happily ever after. Ow, I hit my hand. The end. Hello, I'm Jessica foster I'm excited to tell you that I'm joining the Guilty Feminist on tour. It's uh, all through May. I'll be doing a little bit of stand-up on the 9th in Ipswich, on the 15th in Cardiff, on the 16th in Cambridge, on the 17th in Aylesbury, on the 19th in Oxford. You're right, there's loads of these. On the 23rd in Sheffield and on the 24th in Coventry. See you there, please. I think it's going to be really fun. And it doesn't stop there. We have Sindhu V in Halifax Hull, Newcastle, Salford, Leicester and Nottingham. And we have Bridget Christie in Colchester, Aylesbury, Bournemouth and Southampton. We have Felicity Ward and Kimar Bob in too many places to list. We also have Angela Barnes, Grace Petrie and many more. Go to guiltyfeminist.com slash tour to see the full list and to book. Mm-hmm. 